You are looking at the course of the third cranial nerve. Its nucleus lies in the midbrain. Its fascicles travel ventrally to exit the brainstem in the interpeduncular fossa, traveling rostrally as a solid nerve in the subarachnoid space. When it reaches the posterior clinoid process, it pierces the dura to enter the cavernous sinus and then the orbit via the superior orbital fissure. In the orbit, it supplies four extraocular muscles, the levator palpebri, the iris sphincter muscle, and the ciliary muscle not shown here. Lesions along the course of the nerve impair any or all of its components. Start with the third nerve nucleus. It is situated near the midline of the midbrain tegmentum, immediately ventral to the aqueduct of Sylvius. Nearby are important feeders, the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, or INC, and the rostral interstitial nucleus of the medial longitudinal fasciculus, or RIMLF. The RIMLF initiates vertical gaze. The INC makes sure the eyes stay in vertically eccentric gaze against the elastic orbital forces that would draw the eyes back towards center. Damage to the third cranial nerve can occur anywhere along this pathway. It causes exotropia, ptosis, a dilated pupil, and impairments of adduction, superduction, and infraduction. Abduction will be intact. Here is what it looks like in a patient whose pupil happens to be spared. Look to your right, and look to your left, and right, and left. Okay, and now straight up, and straight down, and up, and down. Way up, and way down. Okay, and now to your right, and left. Let us look now at lesions according to anatomic location. Isolated damage to the third nerve nucleus is extremely rare. When the nucleus is lesioned, there is almost always damage to subjacent third nerve fascicles and especially to the RIMLF and INC. Such a lesion usually leads to a third nerve palsy in one eye and impaired vertical gaze in both eyes. A common cause of this abnormality is occlusion of proximal branches of the posterior cerebral artery, which produces infarction of the midbrain and or the thalamus, a condition called top of the basilar syndrome. Look at the complex features in this patient. Look to your right, left, up, down. Look to your right left, up. These abnormalities can also be subtle. Consider this patient who developed diplopia immediately after heart catheterization. You saw the features of a third nerve palsy in the left eye, but did you also notice the slow downward saccades in the right eye? It is that finding, easily overlooked, that localizes the lesion to the midbrain with damage to the RIMLF. Sure enough, MRI showed a left paramedian midbrain infarct as shown here on diffusion-weighted imaging. What are the implications? The patient will also have balance difficulties and a high risk of falling if unassisted in standing and walking. Recovery from this brainstem third nerve palsy will be much more prolonged than for the conventional extraaxial ischemic third nerve palsy, which you will encounter later in this video. The fascicles of the third nerve consist of axons that emerge from the nucleus. They descend ventrally within the midbrain through the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles, red nucleus, substantia nigra, and medial part of the cerebral peduncle. As they exit the brainstem, the fascicles gather up to form a single nerve that enters the interpeduncular cistern. Damage to third nerve fascicles often produces a partial palsy because the fascicles coming from different subnuclei are widely separated. The fascicles traverse important descending neural pathways,
So a lesion here often causes ataxia from superior cerebellar peduncle involvement or red nucleus involvement or contralateral hemiparesis from cerebral peduncle involvement. Here's an example of a third nerve palsy with contralateral hemiparesis, sometimes labeled a Weber syndrome. This patient suddenly developed mild left upper lid ptosis and diplopia. She has reduced infraduction, superduction, and adduction of the left eye. Her left pupil is dilated and does not constrict to light, but that is not all. She has reduced rotational movements of the right arm, reduced fine finger movements of the right hand, increased deep tendon reflex in the right arm, and increased deep tendon reflex in the right leg. Thus, she has a left third cranial nerve palsy and a contralateral hemiparesis. If there is one lesion, it lies in the left ventral midbrain. It was one lesion, an ischemic stroke. This combination of abnormalities is known as Weber syndrome. The subarachnoid segment of the third nerve travels within the interpeduncular fossa to the cavernous sinus. On the way, it becomes wedged between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery, where it can be easily compressed by an aneurysm at the takeoff of the superior cerebellar artery. Farther along, it runs lateral to the junction of the internal carotid and posterior communicating arteries, an even more common site of compression by aneurysm. This is what such an aneurysm looks like on digital catheter angiography. Actually, the most common third nerve lesion in the subarachnoid segment is caused by ischemia to a border zone between arterial blood supplies to the nerve. It often damages only the core of the nerve, sparing the peripheral axon supplying the iris sphincter so the pupil will have normal size and constriction to light. This patient has complete right upper lid ptosis. Also, she cannot adduct, superduct, or infraduct her right eye. Abduction and intorsion of the right eye are intact. The left eye moves normally. Pupils are equal in size and both constrict normally to direct light. This is a pupil sparing right third nerve palsy. The cause was presumed microvascular ischemia. She recovered spontaneously within eight weeks. The damage usually resolves completely within three months spontaneously. Such ischemic lesions are not visible on any form of brain imaging. The subarachnoid segment is also vulnerable to infectious, inflammatory, non-infectious, and cancerous meningitis. Such conditions are often visible on high-definition enhanced MR imaging. The cavernous sinus segment of the third nerve traverses the outer wall of the cavernous sinus to reach the orbit. The nerve lies within the dorsal portion of two dural leaves. As it traverses the cavernous sinus, the nerve splits into a superior division that will eventually supply the levator palpebri and superior rectus muscles, and an inferior division that will supply the medial rectus, the inferior rectus, the inferior oblique, the iris sphincter, and the ciliary muscle, which controls accommodation and is not evident here. The axons destined for the nerve's superior division are more vulnerable than those destined for the inferior division, so lesions in the cavernous sinus may impair primarily or only upper lid elevation and superduction. Here is an example of that. Now look to your right and left and up. As high up as you can go, way up, good. Now way down, 
The cavernous third nerve segment can also be acutely and dramatically compressed by an expanding hemorrhagic pituitary adenoma, a condition called pituitary apoplexy. Cavernous carotid aneurysms, carotid cavernous fistulas, idiopathic inflammation, metastatic tumors, and meningiomas can also damage the nerve in this location. Within the orbit, third nerve branches enter the extraocular and levator muscle bellies in their posterior portions. The parasympathetic part of the nerve extends farther forward in the orbit on its way to the ciliary ganglion, where it usually synapses and sprouts axons that supply the iris sphincter and ciliary muscles. The nerves to the extraocular muscles and levator palpebrae are not often damaged in the orbit, but the ciliary ganglion and its postganglionic short ciliary nerves are vulnerable to orbital trauma and to a presumed autoimmune inflammation that causes AD tonic pupil. A tonic pupil fails to constrict to direct light but constricts slowly to a near target and dilates slowly when gaze is shifted from a near to a distant target. This phenomenon is called tonic light near dissociation. Here are some guidelines for evaluating non-traumatic third nerve palsy in adults. If the palsy is the only abnormality and the patient does not have cancer, call it isolated. Your first job is to rule out aneurysm by CTA or MRA. I recommend CTA because it's faster, more available, yet very sensitive. If that study is certifiably negative and you can reasonably blame the palsy on extraaxial ischemia, you could defer additional studies to allow the palsy to resolve within three months. If it has not resolved by that time or other abnormalities appear in the meantime, you must consider lumbar puncture or other pertinent studies, including assessment for myasthenia gravis, if the pupil is spared. At outset, if the third nerve palsy is not the only neuroophthalmic abnormality or the patient has cancer, call it non-isolated third nerve palsy. In that case, you must promptly rule out a meningeal or brain parenchymal cause with appropriate imaging and other studies. These rules apply only to adults. In children, even an isolated third nerve palsy must undergo a full evaluation, including brain imaging. Here is another way to approach the management of non-traumatic third nerve palsy using a flowchart. If you think you are seeing a third nerve palsy, be sure it is not an imitator. For example, myasthenia gravis can produce any type of ocular misalignment and may mimic a third nerve palsy, especially if you see reduced vertical ductions and ptosis. But myasthenia should not cause a dilated pupil. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia will impair adduction, but vertical duction should be intact and there will be no ptosis or pupillary abnormality. Actually, isolated impairment of adduction, with or without nystagmus in the abducting eye, is more often internuclear ophthalmoplegia than third nerve palsy. Skew deviation, a vertical misalignment due to interruption of brainstem ocular motor pathways, can occur alone or with internuclear ophthalmoplegia. If skew deviation occurs alone, you should not encounter vertical ductional deficits. Also, the vertical misalignment will not reverse directions with up and down gaze as it would in third nerve palsy. Of course, there will be no ptosis or dilated pupil, but there is often nystagmus, which may be present only in the extremes of gaze. Fourth nerve palsy produces a vertical misalignment that can look like a third nerve palsy. The vertical misalignment should obey the three-step test, and there should be x cyclo deviation on double Maddox rod testing. But there will be no ptosis or dilated pupil.
An orbitopathy that causes swelling or scarring of the extraocular muscles can look like a third nerve palsy, especially if there are vertical ductional deficits. But do not expect to find orbital congestive features in all orbitopathic cases. And of course, neither ptosis nor a dilated pupil will be present. Isolated medriasis is not a manifestation of a third nerve palsy, although it causes widespread alarm in patients and even caregivers. To make a diagnosis of third nerve palsy, expect to find ptosis or ocular ductional deficits. Blame isolated medriasis on prior damage to the ciliary nerves or iris or on exposure to pharmacologic agents that block neural transmission to the iris sphincter or activate the iris dilator muscle. Isolated ptosis often wrongly prompts consideration of a third nerve palsy. Such a diagnosis would only work if there were overlooked ocular ductional deficits. If you have settled on the diagnosis of a real third nerve palsy, you must determine if that palsy is isolated, that is the only pertinent abnormality, or if it is non-isolated, that is, only one of many pertinent abnormalities. If the palsy is isolated, you should immediately exclude a compressive brain aneurysm. Order brain CT and CTA on adults and MRI and MRA in children and in pregnancy. If performed and interpreted properly, such non-invasive studies should be sufficient to exclude an aneurysm large enough to cause a third nerve palsy. If the brain vascular imaging is negative in adults, you could presume a diagnosis of reversible ischemia to the extraaxial segment of the third nerve and defer further investigation to allow for spontaneous recovery within three months. But do not defer further imaging if you have detected signs of aberrant regeneration of the third nerve, which include widening of the palpebral fissure on adduction and failure of descent of the upper lid on infraduction. These signs indicate a disruption of the nerve, usually caused by compression or trauma. In that case, brain MRI scan should be ordered. In youth and pregnancy, if the palsy is isolated and imaging is negative, you could proceed with lumbar puncture or defer further studies blaming the palsy on a viral inflammation. If the third nerve palsy is not isolated at outset in patients of any age, you must presume that it is neither an extraaxial ischemia nor an aneurysm and an order brain MRI scan and other appropriate studies aimed at diagnosing alternative causes.